All right, so before we start on this, I want to look at something from yesterday because there were two good questions that I want to address with everyone. So you can either look at your own notes or you can just follow me. I'm not, nothing was wrong. I'm not changing anything. So you can just look up here if you want. But the question on number nine was, or the statement that was made to me is that I put that it fails the horizontal line test, right? And that's why there's not an inverse. But the inverse actually fails the vertical line test. And that is a true statement. Um, I drew both of these on this one so that you could see that this is a function, this is not. And this fails the vertical line test, and so does this. But so that you don't have to get this graph right here, that's why we do the horizontal line test on the original one. Okay, so if I didn't make that clear, I want to make sure that, that you understand that. So vertical line test we're used to, yes, it's a function. The horizontal line test of a function tells you whether or not it's inverse as a function. Does that make sense to you? So I just wanted to make sure that you weren't confused about what, what, what I was saying about the horizontal line test. Are we good? Yeah. Good, so thank you for that. All right, so the, the other thing that came up was on number 13. So what I did is what's in green here. And a student had what's here in pink, right? And he said, well, is it OK that I do this? So yeah, well, it's the same thing, right? But the reason I wasn't multiplying all that stuff out or like here distributing my three is because when we go to graph it, we want it in that form, right? That helps us graph it. But really, I can graph it from here too, right? If I distributed the three in, then I'd have to factor it back out before I did my transformations as we know them. But either one of these, I can graph just fine. Are these the same thing? Like, if, yeah, if I cube four, it's the same thing, right? This four, as far as transformations are concerned, represents what? A horizontal compression of one fourth, right? What does this 64 represent? A vertical stretch of 64, right? So we would talk about the transformations differently, but in the end, your graph looks the same. So for a cubic, a horizontal compression of one fourth is the same as a vertical stretch of 64. Because if you think about it, when you have your cubic, right, and your parent function looks like this, whether I horizontally compress it, if I horizontally compress it, it's going to squeeze it and make it tall and skinny, right? And then here, if I vertically stretch it, then it's also going to make it tall and skinny, right? But these factors is what would make the same thing happen. So either way is fine. If we were going to graph it on one of these little grids I give you, which one of these two is going to be easier to graph? This one, yeah. And it's, but, you know, but it's not wrong. It would just be hard to find your other point easily to be able to get what you need because it's going to go like way off the graph. Okay. Are we good on that? just want to clear a couple of those things up. All right, so it's not, because it's not wrong if you multiply it out. It's just going to hurt you when you're trying to graph sometimes. All right, so we are here. We are moving on to verifying inverses. This is going on page 43. So we're just verifying what we did yesterday. So the first way we're going to do it is to verify inverses graphically. Okay, so two functions. Our inverses if they are reflections of each other across what? In what? Y equals X. Okay, good. In the line Y equals X. So it says, find the inverse of each function and verify graphically. All right, so is there any question about whether or not these functions have inverses at this point? No, because no, it doesn't say, does it have an inverse? It says, find the inverse, which means there is one, and verify it. So if I'm verifying, that means it works. I just got to show that it works. So this is equal to y. I switch x and y, so I'm going to get 3y minus 6 equals x. So 3y equals x plus 6. So y equals 1 third x plus what? 2. Okay. And so that means that the inverse function is equal to 1 third x plus 2. So I did that. So it says find the inverse. I got it. Then I'm going to verify it graphically. So when you 
graph these if you want, and I'll give you a second if you need to. I, there are colored pencils in your box. You do not have to use different colors, but things are going to overlap. You may choose to. And I realize the salmon paper doesn't lend itself very well to use colored pencils on. But, um, but the colored pencils in the box are erasable, so that's good. They're, they, they're forgiving. And there should be at least one little plastic sharpener in there. If not, and you need one, you can go back. There's some more on the back counter. So if you want to grab a couple colors, if you don't, that's fine too. Just, you know, don't get confused by all the overlap. Right. All right, so I'm going to start by graphing the original one. All right, and it's a line, so it's easy to graph. I'm going to go to negative 6, make my point. My slope is what? What's the slope of, that first, of the original? 3. So I go up 3 and over 1, and then you're going to use a straight edge so that your line looks like an actual line. And draw this in. Oh, shoot, I did it wrong. Looks like that. So there's my line. Your, remember, your ID makes a great straight edge. You can just plop it up there on the table. Then I'm going to graph the inverse. So I go to 2 on the y-axis. This slope is 1 third. So I go up 1 and over 3, make my point. Then use my straight edge to draw in the line. Then I also need to draw in, and I would suggest this one being dotted, just so that you know it's not the other pieces of what you have, your line y equals x. Because it's supposed to be a reflection in y equals x. So having that line in there to be able to see that that's what happens is very helpful. You can see these actually both intersect right on that line. Except my line's off a tiny bit, but it's all. Okay. Any questions about that? So you can see that those are reflections in the line y equals x. They are inverses of each other. Yes? Awesome. All right, so let's move on to the next one. <coughs> this equals y, so we're going to exchange places. y cubed plus 4 equals x. So y cubed equals x minus 4. So y equals the cube root of x minus 4, which means that the inverse is the cube root of x minus 4. So I have found the inverse. Now I have to graph them. This is why the, being able to graph things quickly and accurately was so important, because we're about to graph them, and that's part of something else that we're doing. So this is cubic. When I do this, there are five anchor points. Five. You may not always be able to get all five on the graph, but you at least try the five. Um, there, I took off points on that test for sure. Um, for that, because some of you just did the original three, or like the, the middle three right here, and then your shape wasn't right. Um, all right, so here I have no stretches or compressions. There's no reflections. All that is is a translation what? Up four. My f of x is up four. So I'm going to start at zero, zero, and I just go up four. That means one, one goes up four, and negative one, one does as well. Well, my 2, 8 would go up 4, and then it would be 2 off the graph. So I don't have to graph that one. That's okay. But my negative 2, negative 8, I do need to do that one and go up 4. So then I can draw this in here, something like that. So in that case, there would be four anchor points that you'd have to have for sure. If you wanted to do the one that was off up at the top, there's nothing wrong with that, but I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have, have that one for sure. All right, so then I've got to graph this one. That's the cube root function. Okay, so you've got to know the difference between the two. This one also has five anchor points. This also doesn't have any stretches, compressions, or reflections. It only has a translation where? Right four. Right four. So 0, 0 can go right 4, and then my 1, 1 would be here, and there would be my negative 1, 1. So my 8, 2, again, would be off the graph, so you don't have to have that. 
but my negative 8, negative 2 can go to the right 4, and my graph would look something like this. And there's arrows on both ends. I had to take off points for sad stuff like that, too. I also have to have y equals x drawn in there. So here is y equals x. And are those reflections of each other? They're not. If I take the purple one and reflect it in y equals x, I don't get the pink one? Yes, I do. And remember, if you think about what, like when you very first learned reflections, they probably talked to you about folding a piece of paper. You could even do a little bit of art that way. If, you actually, if I actually folded my paper on that line y equals x, those two things should match up with each other. Okay, everybody good? All right, so that's how we verify graphically. This is a reflection in the line y equals x. So now let's talk about verifying inverses algebraically. Okay, so that's graphically, but let's talk algebraically. Two functions f and g are inverses if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x. This is why we reviewed the compositions. Okay. So again, it says verify algebraically. So are any of my answers going to be they're not inverses? No, because it doesn't say are they inverses. It says verify. So if you're not getting it, something's wrong somewhere, like if you're not getting the, the right answer. Um, so I need to start with f of g of x. That means I'm going to do f of 2x plus 7. So that's equal to 2x plus 7 minus 7 over 2. So in the numerator, do, are those parentheses really that important? No. no. So 2x plus 7 minus 7 is just 2x, and 2x over 2 is which is what we expected to get, right? Your work is your answer. Like, yeah, the answer is x, but the whole point of this is you showing how, how it becomes x. Then I need to find g of f of x. Okay, so that's going to be equal to g of x minus 7 over 2. So that will give me 2 times x minus 7 over 2 plus 7. <clears throat> so that 2 over 1, what can I do here? Cancel the 2's. So I end up with x minus 7 plus 7, which is x. Now, this part right here, you don't necessarily have to write that step. I think it would help some of you make sure you plug the right thing into the other one so that you're not doing it backwards, but you don't always have to. Um, but especially when they get a little stranger, you know, and the more complex the little expressions are, you might want to, but I'm not going to make you do that. Okay, are we good? Any questions? All right. So then let's look at 4. And I want to find f of g of x. So that's equal to f of the square root of x plus 5. So that's going to give me the square root of x plus 5 squared minus 5. What's the square root of x plus 5? X plus 5. Oh, yeah, square root of x plus 5 squared. I'm sorry. I didn't finish my sentence. You're wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, that's, that was my intention. When you square it, you get x plus 5 is what I was trying to get out of my mouth. Minus 5 equals x. Then I have to find g of f of x. So that's g of x squared minus 5. So that's the square root of x squared minus 5 plus 5, which gives me the square root of x squared, which is x. Okay. Any questions at all? I left something off. We've got to go back and put these on there. 
Um, even though we're verifying, what we are verifying is that yes, they are inverses. Okay? So yes, they are inverses. See, I just showed you why. Any questions at all? All right. So the next one is going to take you a little bit more room to write it out because of the fractions. And I don't want you to have to cram it real small. So I'm going to do the first part. I'm going to start up here and then work through all of this because this, we don't need this for anything anyway. So I'll do the first one here, and then we'll do the second one over here. All right. So the first thing I want to find is f of g of x. And that's equal to f of 3 over 2x minus 1. So I take that 3 over 2x minus 1, and I substitute it in everywhere I see an x. So I get 3 over 2x minus 1 plus 3, that's the numerator, all over 2 times 3 over 2x minus 1. Is it important to understand your basic fraction properties? Yes, yes or you are going to get all kinds of lost in here. Because it, it's going to look bad. It's really not that bad. But you have to know what you're doing. And the calculator is not going to help you. All right, so I need to take care of the numerator and the denominator separately at first. So I've got two terms in the numerator. What do I need to do here? Find a common denominator. What will my common denominator be? 2x minus 1. So the first thing stays 3 over 2x minus 1. Plus, and then this I have to multiply by 2x minus 1 over 2x minus 1. So, oops, I wrote 2. 3 times 2x minus 1 over 2x minus 1. So that's the whole numerator now. The denominator. Do I get, do get to cancel these 2s out like I did a second ago? No. no. Okay, but what do I get in the denominator then? 6 over 2x. Good, I get 6 over 2x minus 1. So this looks terrible, but it's really not that bad if you can read your own handwriting and keep up with your stuff. You start to skip a bunch of steps and stuff like this, that's when things get backwards and weird. Okay? Here, this, if I distributed this in, this 3 times 2x minus 1 actually becomes what? 6x minus 3. So I get 3 plus 6x minus 3. What does that give me? 6x over 2x minus 1. That's the numerator, right? being divided by another fraction. So I can put it back in the denominator, but I don't have to. I'm not, since I'm dividing by this, what can I do here? Multiply by, multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to multiply by 2x minus 1 over 6. If the only way that you know how to handle fractions is to multiply straight across and then reduce, you're about to make your life very, very difficult. Okay? So I want to clarify a couple of things, because I had somebody in here the other day that wasn't my student, but they were doing something similar to this, and they said, um, well, my teacher said to cross multiply, and I said, I guarantee you, if they're on this campus, they did not tell you to cross multiply right here. When do you cross multiply? When it's a proportion, when, you, when it's across equal signs, right? So what the teacher said, well, I said, are you sure she didn't say multiply straight across? And he was like, yeah, that's what she said. Those are two completely different things, right? So I think she said multiply straight across, and he processed cross multiplied. Those are two different things. Yes, fractions, you can multiply straight across. That's fine. But you need to learn not just for cases like this, but even when it's just all numbers, how to reduce before you multiply, and it will simplify your life greatly. Can I reduce some stuff before I multiply? Yes. What can I cancel out? The 2x minus 1 and the 2x minus 1. What else? And the 6. So guess what? I'm left with x. I didn't have to physically multiply anything. OK? And if I had, some of you would have distributed, and then you would have been all kinds of confused about what, then you have to factor back out, and you're just doing way too much work. But these types of things, I think most of you get it. The, the weird thing here to me is that you get it when they're expressions like this, but when it's numbers, like it blows your mind when we reduce like that. It's the same thing. So learn how to do it with that so that those big numbers don't become an issue for you. All right, so there's the first part. Then we're going to do g of f of x. And that's equal to g of x plus 3 over 2x. And I'm going to give you a minute to get that one done.
Okay, so numerator is going to stay 3 right now. Yes? Can I reduce anything here? The 2s. Okay, make sure you understand why here I can cancel the 2s out. Totally legal. Here, I cannot cancel them out because there's more than one term down here. That's the difference. Okay, so I'm left with x plus 3 over x minus 1. So my numerator is still going to stay 3. I got to take care of these two terms in the denominator. What do I need? A common denominator in my denominator, right? And what's that common denominator going to be? X. So I'm going to get x plus 3 over x minus x over x. So I still have 3 up here. And then x plus 3 minus x is what? 3, three over x. So that's 3 divided by 3 over x, which means that gives me 3 times what? x over 3. Those 3's cancel out, and you get x. It's like a puzzle, right? You know what the end's supposed to look like? You just got to get it there. Questions? Fractions, fractions, fractions. Okay. I love fractions. We're going to make up a fraction song, and we're going to sing about how much we love fractions. Okay. So here, we're going to find the inverse of each function. So it's telling me to find it, not figure out if there is one. So there is one. I got to find it. And then state any restrictions in the domain and verify graphically and algebraically. So we'll start here with finding the inverse. So I set this equal to y. And then they change places. I get the cube root of y plus 2 equals x. So the cube root of y equals x minus 2. What do I have to do now? Cube both sides, so y equals x minus 2 cubed. So the inverse is x minus 2 cubed. Okay? Everybody with me? So now we're going to graph. Okay, and I'll make the graphs a little bit bigger. They'll seem a little bit better. <coughs> So I'm going to graph the original function first. It's a cube root function, no stretches or compressions or reflections, just a translation where? Up to. Up to. So the cube root, I can start with 0, 0. That's my point of inflection. I go up to. And since there was no stretches or compressions or reflections, there are my first three points. Since it's a cube root, I would have been at 8, 2 would have been another anchor point. And then that just goes up to, to here. I'd have been at negative 8, negative 2, it goes up to, and it's here. You see how quickly and easily you need to be able to graph these? Like, it can't be something that you take forever on just trying to get one sad little graph out. All right, so then I draw in my shape with arrows on either end. There's my cube root. Now I've got to graph the inverse. It's a cubic function. Again, no stretches, compressions, or reflections. It's just a translation where? Right. right to. So I start with my point of inflection, go to the right to. Since there are no stretches, compressions, or reflections, I can get these other two points in there pretty easily. Another anchor point is at 2, 8. And then I just move to the right to. Negative 2, negative 8, and move to the right two. And then I can get this one drawn in. If you're going to sit there and try and make tables every time, this is going to take you forever, right? No tables. I did not substitute in a number anywhere. And I have five points plotted on each one of them, quickly and easily. And then I also need to draw in my y equals x. Oh, come on, I'm bored. Like so. And then you can see that those are reflections of each other across y equals x. And if, they, if the function and the, or, the, or the inverse intersect y equals x, they should intersect at the same point. That point just kind of stuck to it. All right, so now we have to verify that algebraically. So I have to find f of g of x 
and g of f of x. Right? Dang it. So f of, but it's not f and g this time. It's f and the inverse. So f of f inverse of x is equal to f of x minus 2 cubed, which would then give me the cube root of x minus 2 cubed plus 2. So what's the cube root of x minus 2 cubed? x minus 2. So that's equal to x minus 2 plus 2, which is x. <coughs> It's nice when you know what the answer is supposed to be. You just got to get there, right? All right, so then the inverse, f inverse of the f of x is equal to f inverse of the cube root of x plus 2. All right, so that's going to give me, I substitute this into the inverse, so that's the cube root of x plus 2 minus 2, and all of that is cubed. So 2 minus 2 zeroes out, so I end up with x cubed, or the cube root of x cubed, which is just what? x, and I'm done. Everybody okay with that? Yes? Good deal. All right, let's look at 7. So here I have a domain restriction, right? Because this is a quadratic. Does a, does a parabola without a domain restriction have an inverse? No. We have to have a domain restriction to actually have an inverse, otherwise it fails that horizontal line test. Okay, so let's find the inverse. So I get y plus 4 squared minus 2 equals x. So y plus 4 squared equals x plus 2. What do I have to do here? Square root. Y plus 4 equals the square root of x plus 2. Now, every, remember, every time you introduce a square root, you have to put the plus or minus, right? But we don't here. Why not? Well, not because it started with squared. because It's only because I, it's because I have this restriction, right? And I only want the positive ones. I don't want the negative ones because that gives me the, the bottom part, which would make it fail that test. So I, that's why there's no plus or minus here. So then y is equal to the square root of x plus 2 minus 4, and that's the inverse of f of x. OK? Everybody good? All right, so let's graph these. So I'm going to start with this one, and I have a domain restriction, right? So I can go ahead and start with my anchor point for a parabola. My vertex will be at 0, 0. No stretches or compressions or reflections, just translations. Where do I go here? Right. Left, four. Left 4, 2, 3, 4, and down 2. So this point, does that point live in my domain? Yeah, because x has to be greater than or equal to negative 4, so I'm good. That means negative 1, 1, I don't use. I'm only going to get the right half of the parabola. So I go to 1, 1, move to the left 4, and down 2. Go to 2, 4, move to the left 4, and down 2. And those are the three points that I would get to get that right side of my parabola. Okay. Now, this had a domain restriction. Does this have a domain restriction? How, how can I figure out the domain of this before I ever get it? Well, the, the domain of this comes from what of my original one? The range, right? What is the range of this? Negative 2 to infinity, right? So that means this range, because I switched x and y, the domain and range switch places too. So this is this domain restriction. That's different than this. This domain restriction is the range. So just like you could see right here, but also from here, that x has to be greater than or equal to what? Negative 2. Because that's the range values from there. Okay. So if there's a domain restriction, you have to state it with the function. Then we have to go and graph it. So I'm going to go, I start at 0, 0. I'm going to go to the left 2 and down 4, make my point. My next anchor point for a square root is 1, 1. 
I go to the left two, down four. My next anchor point is four two. I go to the left two and down four. Those are my three points. There's my square root function. And then I draw in my y, oh, that is not good. My y equals x. Okay, everybody good with all that? That's a reflection, right? In the line y equals x. Okay, so now we got to verify algebraically. So f of the inverse of f of x is equal to f of the square root of x plus 2 minus 4. So that's equal to square root of x plus 2 minus 4 plus 4 squared minus 2. So minus 4 plus 4 zeroes out. Then I just have the square root of x plus 2 squared, which gives me x plus 2 minus 2, which is x. I am going fast. You should be able to go fast too. Okay? All right, so then I have to find the f inverse of, oh, of f of x. So that's the f inverse of x plus, oh my goodness, I cannot even write, x plus 4 squared minus 2. So now I get the square root. <coughs> You know, if you weren't trying to talk while I was talking and you were trying to write, you could probably actually keep up a little bit better. Um, so then I got x plus 4 squared minus 2 plus 2 minus 4. So that minus 2 plus 2 zeroes out. I get the square root of x plus 4 squared, which is x plus 4 minus 4 equals x. Am I good? It's all verifying, okay? Any questions at all? We good? I don't think we need to do the last two, right? You got the hand of it, right? We don't need to. All right, good deal. So the back of that is the, assi of the assignment you got yesterday is the assignment for this. On Monday, I am taking this from you and grading the front and then giving it back to you. But that was my plan the other day, but I didn't because I was out in the hall with y'all for so long. Um, so make sure that you have the front done. If you have them both done, you just want to give it to me on Monday to keep, that's fine too. But if you haven't finished the back, I'll give it back to you to finish before Tuesday. Okay?